From the origins of the name Matey, to the pirate captain who had the cook burned alive because he thought he would cook well, today's tantalizing story of New England's misbehavior is that of pirates. My name is Jen, and this is Outcasts and Dissidents, New England's History of Misbehavior, where we talk about crazy true stories, real renegades, and rebellious countercultures of New England's past. The so-called golden age of piracy was from the late 17th century into the early to mid 18th century, although there have been many iterations and eras of piracy throughout human history. It just so happens that this golden age coincides perfectly with the colonization of New England. We've got plenty to talk about, so we better dive right in. We'll discuss here piracy in the conventional sense, although another form of piracy was privateering. Privateers were essentially pirates commissioned by the government to loot ships of contraband or whatever else they were looking for, usually against enemy nations and rivals and all of that stuff. A lot of conventional outlaw pirates started as privateers, fed up with the poor treatment and low reward of such risky and miserable employ. It was not uncommon for privateers to have been forced into service by so-called press gangs in predatory drafts rather than as willing volunteers. More on that in future episodes. It is also worth mentioning that in 1808, international slave trafficking was made, effectively under law, an act of piracy. Enslaved people could still be bought and sold from the Americas, but not taken from their homeland in Africa, eradicating the triangle trade. Pirating enslaved people they did, right up until at least 1860. So what did conventional pirates do exactly? What did a pirate's life entail? Pirates sailed the open seas, often on high-traffic shipping routes, preying on other ships carrying merchandise, weapons, and riches. They would approach them, often by ruse, and a few things could ensue. They might plunder the merchandise and set them free, take over their ship if they wanted or needed it, and send them off or leave them adrift on their own ship, or sometimes take volunteers or crew by force. These encounters could be horrendously violent, including cannon fire, gunfights, sword swinging mayhem, and torture if the victim ship resisted. Other times, the victim ship just didn't want none with the encroaching pirates and would rather surrender peaceably than fight. It was easier than you might think for pirate captains to use these opportunities to conscript more pirates for their crew. If the other captain was something of a dick to his crew, they might gladly join just to stick it to the man, especially if they were black. And they were usually dicks. Privateers were already halfway there, so they kind of might as well if they were disgruntled enough. Pirates also rallied new conscripts in ports, often with music, interestingly. Think of drumming up volunteers. For black men, free or enslaved, piracy offered relative freedom, wealth, and liberty they otherwise would not know. Enslaved plantation workers and laborers were sometimes able to escape re-enslavement as quote-unquote runaways by signing a ship's articles with pirates in port, at least for a time, lest they be recaptured or arrested. To say salvation was guaranteed and they would be free from racism altogether is a stretch and untrue. But compared to other prospects, and with the sweet satisfaction of sticking it to the man, their quality of life was likely to be at least somewhat improved. Other times, if there were too few volunteers, they were forced to join, sometimes right off of slave ships captured by pirates, not necessarily as slaves, but with the benefits and protection of anyone else on the ship's articles, at least on some ships. A pirate ship's articles were a contract with terms and conditions agreed upon by the crew. Even corporal punishment like flogging right up to execution were decided and agreed upon by the crew in the ship's articles. In this way, pirates were more diplomatic than the quote-unquote law-abiding merchant mariners. They even had quartermasters who made sure nobody, even the captain, took more than their share of the booty. The captain was, in fact, democratically elected by the crew. Unlike other maritime ventures, the crew could overthrow a captain that was too harsh or didn't follow the code of conduct prescribed by the ship's articles. Another kind of surprising way that pirates were more revolutionary than their law-abiding counterparts was that they had 
an accepted form of gay marriage as early as the 1600s. Having women on a ship was considered bad luck by pirate lore, and to be fair, women and subsequent infants would have been a liability in such a brutal lifestyle. As outlaws, piracy allowed dissent from social norms and homophobic laws as severe as death in these Puritan times. Pirates would agree to a sort of marriage contract called matelotage to both ensure that they would have someone, their matelot, or matey, to take their share of riches and property in the not unlikely event of their untimely death and to offer the indulgence in a life at sea without female counterparts. Sometimes this could be a romantic or sexual partnership, other times strictly functional. Often pirates are very young, sometimes in their teens or adolescence, believe it or not, so their formative and early adult years were spent in the company of men almost exclusively in a culture where this was entirely normal. Some older pirates were married with a family at home, or perhaps one they had to abandon for legal reasons, but even then they could still have a buddy on board. However, there is an old proverb that speaks to maritime reality well. Those who would go to sea for pleasure would go to hell for a pastime. As revolutionary and liberated as the life of a pirate was, enlisting on a ship came with only one guarantee. Things could go wrong. Tyrannical leaders, torture, disease, starvation, shipwreck, and more were very real risks. Even execution, if caught, was not unlikely. To have been forced to sign a ship's articles was your only get-out-of-jail-or-hanging-free card. On the open ocean, you had nowhere to run, even on the biggest ship. You were an outlaw at the vengeful mercy of the high seas, temperamental men, and unpredictable weather. You were also just kind of salty and soggy all of the time. And many of them had syphilis, which they treated with mercury, which can make you go insane, as if the clap doesn't already. And then there's the food. Oh, the food. The poor cooks had it rough. They had to do the best they could with limited provisions. Hard tack, which is more comparable to dog biscuits than anything to make the Pillsbury Doughboy giggle. All kinds of salt-preserved meat and fish just whatever was kicking around. The cook, even doing the best they could, had a hard hand. Not a particularly popular fella, and clearly pirates hadn't heard that you don't mess with the cook. Oh, they also drank booze. Lots of booze. Rum in particular. The water wasn't generally safe to drink, and definitely not seawater, and other goods like coffee and tea were perishable, especially if they got wet. Alcohol, particularly in dark-tinted glass, now called pirate glass, was shelf-stable and also probably made life on a ship a bit more tolerable, so they really gave her hell. In fact, alcoholism could expedite and exacerbate the symptoms of scurvy. This is especially true if alcohol takes precedence over food in one's diet. I'm sure everyone has heard of scurvy, vitamin C deficiency. Early symptoms are irritability, weakness, and fatigue, and joint pain. Hair, tooth, gum, and skin problems, including bleeding under the skin causing a scurvy rash, will follow. Anemia, or low red blood cells, and edema, water retention under the skin causing swelling, also can occur in more severe cases. Compacted with other inherent deficiencies, you could die without treatment, also known as a well-rounded diet. In one raid by Blackbeard, who does have loose ties to New England but isn't featured in this episode, um, he left a pillage crew of enslavers on his old beat-up boat with thousands of pounds of beans. As he, his crew, and newly conscripted, able-bodied African captives sailed off with the slave ship and whatever booty, thousands of pounds of beans. Now, I love a good chili, but damn, if that's what you have in the kitchen to last you a few weeks or even months, a quick plunder for some dietary variety alone seems worth it. If there was fresh food on board, you'd talk about a commodity, right? Really, though, piracy was more about the riches that allowed for a lush lifestyle. With New England being a substantial hub for maritime trade and the wealth that came along with it, it was a bit of a perhaps unexpected hotbed for pirate activity. We generally associate pirates with warm tropical places, mostly thanks to Hollywood, but let's talk about some of the pirates associated with the New England ports, shall we? The coolest name award goes to Captain Dixie Bull, and also the honor of being New England's first resident pirate. A Londoner by birth, he came to New England in 1631 and was given a land grant by Sir Ferdinando Gorgias. He lived there in York, Maine as a trader of beaver skins. 
He seemed to get along well with both the indigenous folks and the other colonists as far as Mount Desert Island, almost 200 miles down east. Only a year later, he was himself confronted by French pirates while out along Maine's Penobscot River in the vicinity of Castine, about 150 miles from home, conducting business. They took all of his goods, including furs, textiles, and all of his biscuits, along with his little sailboat. According to John Winthrop, governor of Massachusetts, which included Maine until 1820, the French pirates came in a pinnace to Penobscot and rifled a trucking house belonging to the Plymouth colony, carrying thence 300 weight of beaver and other goods. They took also one Dixie bull and his shalloping goods. SOL and not happy about it, he crossed to the dark side. I guess if you can't beat him, and there's no help to be had, you join him. Evidently, he was quite a salesman because he mustered 15 other men to join him as a pirate, targeting the French complete with articles. They started their own English versus French mini-war at a time when the French and English were already at war, kind of allowing their piracy to go under the guise of a civilian army type perception in the community. Unfortunately, targeting only the French was insufficient to sustain the crew, so they began plundering local vessels too, at which point the jig was up and they were now known pirates. According to a totally random webpage from the town of Penobscot, Maine, about buried treasure in Maine, one of his hordes was worth $400,000 in old-timey money and is buried on Damaris Cove Island near Booth Bay, Maine. If found today, says the article, its value could be 10 times that amount. One of his men may or may not have treasure on John's Island. There was supposedly a tavern on the north end of the island, and one frequent patron was a mysteriously wealthy, potentially, shall we say, transient Portuguese man. When he died, he gave a friend a map of John's Island, according to the article, that showed a well near the old tavern. He told the friend that there was a treasure in the well from Dixie's ship Daredevil. Apparently, no one has ever found the well or the treasure, but clearly, these men were in a lucrative business. Their first loss of life amongst the ranks occurred at Pimaquid Harbor, Maine, where they looted a quarter mill in booty by today's money at the expense of Dixie's right-hand man's life. The trading post and villagers didn't put, mu put up much of a fight, according to accounts, but an in indigenous man fired a musket at the pirates while the crew was loading the booty into the sloop, hitting Dixie's homie in the chest. Reality hit for some of the men who deserted, but others kept right on plundering communities and merchant vessels in the Gulf of Maine. That fall, Mr. John Winthrop rallied forces to hunt Dixie and his men. Unsuccessful, there are several theories about what happened to Dixie, but the true story is not known. Some say he swayed to the side with the French, Others say he returned to England and may or may not have been hung there for his crimes and misbehavior. Next, let's just get to the baddest New England pirate. Pull up the feel-good puppy pictures because it's about to get real. Captain Ned Lowe, the baddest of them all, was a ruthless, bloodthirsty bastard born in the late 1600s to a family of criminals. He took it to another level. Dear Ned loved to fight as a kid. He'd find any reason to and liked games in which the point, at least for him, was to fight more than to play. He lived back and forth between Boston and England as a youngster, moving back to Boston permanently as an adult, so he thought. He worked in a rigging house for many years, married a woman he is said to have loved truly and deeply, and had a daughter with her. Lovely story, right? Wrong. Shortly after, his wife died, and he fairly well came unglued. As evil as he soon became, it is said that he carried an open sadness about it, and even wept talking about her. Leaving his daughter with relatives, Ned found his first and last merchant sailing gig on a logwood sloop chartered for a warm, sunny island paradise in the Bay of Honduras to pick up precious wood used to make expensive purple dye. Getting there seems to have gone fine, but it wasn't long before things went awry. The captain wanted the crew, of which Ned was foreman, to bring in another load of timbers onto the ship before dinner and settling down for the evening. This was hard work, you guys. You had to load the logs onto the longboat and paddle back to the ship and now move them from the longboat to the ship and put them away. The crew was over it. They were tired and hungry. The captain, speaking of asshole merchant captains, thought offering the crew a bottle of rum would change their minds and make it go faster, so he said. So Ned tried to shoot him with a musket and accidentally killed someone else because of course he did. I mentioned he was a scrappy one, right? Along with 12 other hangry fellas from the crew, he took the sea, he took to the sea in a longboat and they mutually agreed their best bet was to just become pirates. The next day, they commandeered a small ship they 
made a black flag and declared war against all the world, according to the aptly named 1922 biographical called Pirates by C. Labatt Fraser. In a fairly short time, Lowe had a crew of 80 men and several vessels. They continued their tirade, torturing, murdering, and plundering vessels throughout the Atlantic world. By murdering, I mean dozens and dozens of people. Hundreds, by the end of it. On one ship alone, they killed 70 men. They also committed the mass murder of basically the entire community of Carbonier, Newfoundland, and burned down the village after pillaging it. Needless to say, these ludicrous acts of violence did not go unnoticed as the brutality was accounted for by survivors and witnesses from Canada to the Caribbean. He was a depraved, nightmarish horror movie villain and a wanted man. Lowe's reputation was such that mariners far and wide knew of his brutality, and all he usually had to do to get what he wanted was to make threats and take hostage hostages. But what's the fun in that when you're a murderous psychopath? One man, a French cook, was burned alive because Lowe felt he would cook well. You can see the logic and another Portuguese man was disemboweled because Lowe didn't like the looks of him. That particular raid went horribly wrong, in fact, and Lowe was accidentally slashed in the face with a cutlass, karma for that one time with a musket. He had to have his face sewn back together, and it never healed properly. I mean, it might have gone better, except that he criticized the definitely drunk and probably petrified doctor Stitches. The doctor had what we might nowadays call an amygdala hijack and punched him in the wound as hard as he could, splitting it back open, and told him to stitch his own damn face back up. Sew up your own chops and be damned, to quote. Priceless. On another ship, they killed over 30 men after cutting off the captain's lips for throwing the equivalent of $750,000 overboard. But first, Lowe had the lips cooked and fed to the first mate in front of all of the captives, and then the mass murder. A few months or so later, he cut out the heart of a captain and forced a captive to eat it, and then killed everyone, over 50 crewmen. You can't even make this stuff up, friends. Lowe was bonkers. His crew began to desert him, which is the best news we've had in a while here, but of course, Lowe just recruited more men by force. But every deserter is kind of a life saved, right? In June of 1723, a man of war with a crew of 120 men was sent after them. After a long, challenging battle, Lowe and his portion of the crew escaped, but the companion vessel, captain and crew, were captured by the man. After a three-day trial in Rhode Island, over two dozen of them were executed and only eight were pardoned. They probably could prove that they were forced into piracy by Lowe, and surely no one would blame them for just kind of going along with what he wanted. Unfortunately, they did not have therapists in the 18th century for these poor dudes. A tough hand dealt, a lot to cope with and never unsee. Yet, as if Lowe wasn't already in a rageful little monster, now it wasn't just war, but revenge. Lowe started with a few whalers, torturing and murdering them off the coast of Rhode Island in his characteristic way by severing their ears, noses, whatever he felt like. Seemingly more to make his point that he was there, he knew about the executions, and he was pissed. It doesn't seem that he readily even plundered these whaling vessels, mostly that he just hurt people. He continued about his murderous mayhem all over the North Atlantic before moving off to Africa, where he again deserted a companion vessel and then dropped off the face of the earth. No one is sure what happened to him. He never saw his daughter again, and that's all we know. On a relatively lighter note, Captain Black Sam Bellamy is my favorite New England pirate. He is well known in Cape Cod to this day, but to me, he's an absolute gem for his social descent and this one particular seethingly scornful rant that just puts a perfect bow on top of his rebellious nature. His tangent wonderfully illustrates the motives and the spirit of piracy on its most fundamental lever level. The over-the-top violence, not really, but the initial drive of the everyman to make the choice to sign on as a pirate, for sure. As the crew plundered a merchant ship in 1717, Bellamy tried to coerce the captain to join his ranks. He refused. This set Bellamy off. Check this out. It's almost impossible to read and not do the pirate accent, but I'm really bad at the pirate accent, and I'm going to be haunted by pirates for the rest of my life if I try. So I'll see if I can do it without laughing. Damn ye, you are a sneaking puppy. 
and so are all those who submit to be governed by the laws which rich men have made for their own security. For the cowardly whelps have not the courage otherwise to defend what they get by their knavery. He goes on and on. They vilify us, as scoundrels do, when there is only this difference. They rob the poor under the cover of the law, forsooth, and we plunder the rich under the protection of our own courage. The captain reviews some more, stating loyalty to God and essentially the elitist, it fueled a Bellamy's fire. Damn ye, I am a free prince, and I have every bit as much authority to make war on the whole world. Yes, Bellamy, you do. There is no arguing with such sniveling puppies who allow superiors to kick them about deck at pleasure and pin their faith upon the pimp of a parson, a squab who neither practices nor believes what he puts upon the chuckle hunt chuckle-headed fools he preaches to. It's 10 out of 10, the year 1717's most epic slam. He takes on both social and religious institutions in two paragraphs. It warms my heart. This sentiment rang as an epitomized Robin Hood-type call to action and offered the escape for those whom the rich marginalize, such as the impoverished or the enslaved. As great as this perspective was for marketing his mission to prospects, it also was a place of sincere resentment from the corruption and oppression of the time. Motivated by his love for a wealthy woman, Bellamy started pirating with a friend as a wrecker, just like a scavenger pirate, who plundered wrecks rather than active vessels, so he would have enough wealth for her family to allow him to marry her. But upon finding the first of his actual pirate crew, deprived English loggers at a camp near South America, his hatred for the rich thickened. He actually resolved to rob the rich to give to the poor sailors they came across as a true Robin Hood of the seas. However, Bellamy, or any pirate for that matter, ought not be too glorified. By the same token, as always is the case when looking at people of the past, it was a different time, and we can't judge them too harshly either. They were criminals, yes. Did they truly mean well at times? I'll offer Bellamy at least an exemption from judgment for his spunk and badassery. In eloquence, of course. Bellamy always had a rebellious nature. Before turning wrecker or pirate, he got the name Black Sam, refusing to wear the trendy white powdered wigs, choosing to flaunt his long black hair with a black ribbon instead. He also always dressed above his cast. Both he... <laughs> yeah. He both refused to look poor and refused to subscribe to the fashion of the rich. Basically, if he liked it, he wore it. If he didn't, he didn't. It was, wasn't up to anyone to decide for him what he should wear or how he should act. A kindred free spirit. After a year of piracy with a total score of 53 ships, he was satisfied that he had sufficient booty to marry his love and sought to return to Cape Cod. His ship, the Wida, got separated from the fleet. They had agreed that if they got separated, they would meet at the aforementioned Damariscove Island in Maine off of Booth Bay. It was a safe haven because unlike the southern New England area, the indigenous folks won their part of King Philip's War, the Northern Theater, and subsequent wars further helped to keep European settlements from thriving at the time, basically anywhere north slash east of the Saco River. It, they could hide out there undetected in what we now know as Down East Maine. For a few possible reasons, Bellamy and his crew chose to veer west and head towards Cape Cod. Why was Bellamy interested in going this way instead of going along with the plan? Maybe it was greed? Maybe a simple foolish decision? We will never know. Regardless, they were sailing into a storm, and as near as they made it to Cape Cod, they didn't get home. On the night of April 26, 1717, the powerful nor'easter drove the Wida into a cliff face. The devastation was fast and mighty. Of 163 men on board, only two survived. One was a man from Cape Cod's Mosquito Tribe, and one was a carpenter forced to work for Bellamy until they could find a new carpenter to maintain the ships. Among the dead were Bellamy and a roughly nine-year-old boy from a ship they looted who demanded to join the crew or he'd kill his mother. Sounds like a great kid. We actually know the story of the child is true, because 267 years later, when the wreck was found and explored, they found the child's remains on the ship. The leg was confirmed to be wearing what was described in the account of the boy joining the pirates 
and said leg bone was scientifically proven to be from a boy his reported age. Also on the ship were millions in booty. According to the aforementioned totally random web article about the hidden pirate booty in Maine, linked in the description, the headquarters of Bellamy and Williams near the mouth of the Machias River has just about disappeared, but somewhere near is hidden one of the richest pirate caches in North America, one that has just never been reported found. If you ever find it, you better split it with me, I'm just saying. But in conclusion, piracy never really ended, as there are still pirates in some parts of the world today. But it did fade out in New England. It seems from the timeline that some may have turned to slave piracy, smuggling African captives after 1808. We'll get into slave piracy some more in the future. What we did cover here today included a crash course on piracy, New England's first resident pirate, Dixie Bull, New England's baddest pirate, Ned Lowe, and my favorite New England pirate, Sam Bellamy. I actually think I should do a full episode on Bellamy at some point because, well, we covered the basics and what I love about him. He skipped a lot, including the tragedy of his wife-to-be that ensued as all of this was going on. There will definitely be more pirate episodes since we only talked about three of them and not even Captain Kidd at all. So why not do him justice too? For more episodes like this one and definitely future episodes on pirates, be sure to subscribe. And if you really want to make my day, go on over to my website, outcastanddissidents.com to su- subscribe for updates and additional content and donate so I can justify nerding out on all this for you, my friends making more episodes more often. If you want to learn more, this episode comes with an annotated bibliography and sh- in the show notes. The theme music in this episode is called Northern Saints by Swirling Ship. Until next time, I'll be wishing you fair winds and following seas.